San Diego, who's going to tell us about uh, robust uh, lead coding. Hey everybody, thanks. I'm going to talk today about robust list decoding of spherical Gaussians. Um, so the basic outline of this talk, I'm going to talk a bit about the problem setup and some sort of historical development. I'm going to talk about sort of the information theoretic bounds and what we might hope to achieve. Um, I'll then talk about the basic technique that we, that's been known for a while to get sort of anything on these kinds of problems using this idea of filters and the generalization to multi-filters. Um, that will lead to sort of an obstacle, making it hard to get the kinds of errors that we want. And to overcome that, we're going to need to make use of higher degree information. And I'll talk a little bit about how to do that. And if there's time, I'll then go on and talk uh, about an application to learning mixtures of spherical Gaussians. Um, so to begin with, let's start with this pretty simple problem. There's some Gaussian G and Rn. Say it's known to have identity covariance matrix, but the mean is unknown. And you're, say, given a bunch of independent samples from this Gaussian and would like to learn an approximation to the mean. Now, this is a pretty classic problem in statistics. Um, it's sort of well understood that if you let mu hat be the sample mean, then this is a pretty good estimator. And in fact, the error is something like O of square root n over m with m samples. And this goes to 0 as your number of samples goes to infinity, which is about the best you can hope for. OK, let's make our lives more difficult. Again, we have this Gaussian with an unknown mean. But instead of getting samples just from the Gaussian, there's some other distribution x that returns a Gaussian sample with probability 1 minus epsilon. But with epsilon probability returns samples from some other distribution, perhaps some adversarially chosen error distribution. Now, once again, you're given a bunch of independent samples, this time from x, and you'd like to learn an approximation to the true mean. Now, this problem is substantially more difficult. So Tukey in what, the 60s or 70s, I think, gave what amounts to an exponential time algorithm to get O of epsilon error. And it's not hard to show that in terms of error rate, that's information theoretically optimal, at least up to constants. And there have been various, there are various polynomial time algorithms that give error O of epsilon square root of n. Um, but for a long time, these were sort of the only types of algorithms known exponential time or bad error. Um, this was fixed only a couple of years ago, um, where a big paper, including these people, um, gave a polynomial time algorithm that actually got down to O of epsilon square root log 1 over epsilon error. And this works against the slightly stronger error model. Um, uh, and But you know it's almost the best possible error, and it works in polynomial time which is good. And so this version of the problem is nearly resolved, especially because a more recent paper by, I think, exactly the same authors gave a polynomial time algorithm that in this uh, particular error model gets the error down to O of epsilon. Um, so there's been substantial recent work on robust statistics on this and sort of similar problems. Um, and well, that's the easy version. OK, let's make things more difficult. So again, Gaussian with an unknown mean. But now instead of adding just epsilon error, we're going to add a lot of it. So we have a distribution x that with some small alpha probability returns good samples from our Gaussian. But otherwise, with, with 1 minus alpha probability returns samples from our error distribution. Once again, we have a bunch of independent samples from x. And we'd like to learn an approximation to the mean. Now, as I've stated it, this problem is actually information theoretically impossible. Because if our distribution x was just a mixture of Gaussians, then even if your algorithm learned the distribution x exactly, which is the most you can hope to do from samples, it would still have no way to know which of these component Gaussians was the real g. And therefore, if they have means that are far apart from each other, there's no one hypothesis you can give that with high probability gives you a good approximation to the true mean. So to make this all possible, we're going to want to relax our, um, our requirements a little bit. So we're going to try to do list decoding. Um, we're going to allow our algorithm to return several hypotheses, maybe some polynomial list or something like that. 
with only the guarantee that at least one of these hypotheses that we returned is close to the actual mean. Question? Yeah. In the previous work, what did epsilon represent? Uh, epsilon represented the error rate, and that was considered to be small. Here, alpha is representing the non-error rate, which we're considering to be small. Okay, so this sort of robust list decoding problem, it was originally studied by uh, a paper of Steinhardt, Charakar, and Valiant uh, last year. And what they gave is a polynomial time algorithm using some convex programming techniques. It returns O of 1 and alpha many hypotheses and got error about alpha to the minus a half. Um, now, this it turns out is not the best, but before we get into too much detail about how to solve this problem, we should first ask ourselves what kind of errors are actually information theoretically achievable so that we don't set our sights too high. And in particular, you can prove some reasonable lower bounds on the final errors that you expect to get. Because, well, what happens if you have maybe a standard Gaussian? Now, what you can do is you can sort of, if you only need to hide something sort of an alpha mass Gaussian under this, if you center this other Gaussian distance, you know, square root log 1 over alpha over some large constant away from the middle, you can nearly hide it under this large Gaussian, basically because the Gaussian you're trying to hide is a lot shorter. Um, and eventually the tails sort of stick out a little bit beyond where they should, but there's very little probability mass in those tails once you get far enough out. And in particular, if we just add a little bit of probability mass to x to cover up some of those extra tails, we can hide something like alpha to the minus omega of c, um, such many such Gaussians that are sort of all pretty far apart from each other. <clears throat> and in particular, this gives us a lower bound. There's no algorithm that returns only polynomial and 1 over alpha many hypotheses. Oh, uh, sorry, was there a question? Yeah, just what is an omega of a constant? I mean, it, it, well, I mean, C isn't really constant here. I mean, you can think of it, C as getting large slowly. Um, you should think of C as being sort of an arbitrarily large constant, maybe. And so what I'm saying is that as the denominator gets arbitrarily large, the exponent gets arbitrarily large as well. <clears throat> Okay, so the, the proposition is that there's no algorithm that returns only polynomial and 1 over alpha many hypotheses, so that with probability at least two-thirds uh, guarantees that one of the hypotheses is little o of root 1 and alpha from the true mean. And the counterexample is just sort of exactly what I said. You build this x, you start with your standard Gaussian, you add this tiny bit of extra tails that allows you to hide this super polynomial in many number of Gaussians, where the two of them, any two of them, their means are separated by about square root log 1 over alpha. And if your algorithm doesn't have, there's no way your algorithm can tell which of these sort of hidden Gaussians is the real one. And so unless you're willing to return something like one hypothesis for each of these Gaussians or are allowing error of square root log 1 over alpha, um, there's nothing you can do other than return a super polynomial number of hypotheses. Yeah? No dependence on the dimension? Um, this, I guess, assumes that the dimension is big enough. Um, but the dimension probably only needs to be something like log 1 over alpha for this to work. No, but I'm asking if alpha is fixed and the dimension grows, can't you hide more and more hypotheses? Um, well, you might be able to. I didn't see an easy way to manage that, um, but, but that seems very plausible. Um, Do you have many directions where to hide your, uh, hide your imposter? You do have more directions of where to hide your imposter. The problem is that, I mean, the construction at least that I'm doing here, I need to allocate a little bit of extra mass to x to like cover up the tail of each imposter. And that, that limits the number of imposters that I can have in a way that, that having more dimensions to hide them in doesn't really fix. Um, but like, if instead you assume that like you didn't need the full Gaussian there, it just needed to be most of the mass of the Gaussian, then you could hide exponential and n many imposters without any difficulty. Um, anyway, 
Um, so this is what we can't do, but it turns out that at least up to issues of computational efficiency, um, this is roughly tight. So there is an inefficient algorithm at least that returns only O of one in alpha many hypotheses, such that with probability at least two thirds, you guarantee that at least one of these hypotheses is within O of root log one over alpha of the true mean. And um, the way to do this is a little bit interesting. So um, what you can do is you can sort of let H be the set of all possible points X that could reasonably be the correct mean. And for that, what do I mean? Well, there should be a set of points S sub X that sort of correspond to the good samples. And it should be large, which consists of at least an alpha over two fraction of all of the samples. And also it should be concentrated about X, because Gaussians are well concentrated about their mean. And in particular, this means that if, say, if we look in any direction about the mean, at most an alpha over 10 fraction of the points from SX are further than two root log one over alpha from X in that direction. And so basically we've got good tail bounds in any direction from the set of points centered at X. And you should note that with high probability, the true mean is in this set of hypotheses where the set of points is just the set of good samples. Now, of course, this doesn't work because this set H is going to be infinite in size and that's too many hypotheses. Um, but there's a not bad solution to this. The idea is we're going to cover the set H with a small number of balls. And so we can just return the set of centers to those balls and the true mean will be close to one of, will be inside one of those. So the lemma that we want here is that there's a set, there are, sorry, that there is no set of five over alpha elements of H that are pairwise separated by more than four root log one over alpha. And this lemma will immediately imply our cover because we can just take a maximal set of elements of H that are pairwise separated by four root log one over alpha. This set has to be small by the lemma. And furthermore, because it's a maximal set, um, every element of H, including the true mean, has to be within four root log one over alpha of one of these hypotheses. Okay, so how do we prove this lemma? Um, well, the idea is to look at overlaps between these good sets. So in particular, the claim is that if X and Y are far away, these sets S sub X and X sub Y that are concentrated about the two of them have to have small overlap. And in particular, this is going to allow us to say that if we have many X's that are all pairwise separated, we'll just have to have too many points allocated to all of these sets. And so the first lemma is that if X and Y are separated by more than four root log one over alpha, the size of the intersection of S, X, and X, Y is at most alpha over 10 times the sum of the sizes of these two sets. And the proof is pretty easy. Bas remember that uh, one of the properties of these sets was that they were well concentrated about the point they were centered at when projected along any line. So what we're going to do is we're going to project along the line separating the mean, the two means, X and Y. And we note that all but a tiny fraction of the points in S sub X have to be closer to X than Y along this line. And all but a tiny fraction of the points in S sub Y have to be closer to Y than X. And therefore, any points in the intersection need to correspond either to a point in X that was an SX that was actually closer to Y or a point in SY that was actually closer to X and both of those sets are small. So once we have this overlap lemma, there's a pretty simple counting argument. If we have a bunch of points X1 through XM and H that are pairwise separated by this four root log one over alpha, then what if we look at the size of the union of these sets? Well, by approximate inclusion exclusion, this is at least the sum of the sizes of the sets minus the sum of the sizes of the pairwise overlaps. And that's, you know, this alpha over 10 size of S, X, I plus size of S, X, J. But now sort of combining terms, this is going to give us the size of S, X, I times one minus M alpha over 10 or something like that from the overlaps. And this is at least something like m times alpha over 2 size of s 
times 1 minus m alpha over 10. And if m is, say, 5 over alpha, this is going to be more than the size of s, more than the total number of samples. And this, of course, is a contradiction because this union is contained in s. Um, and so, I mean, this completes the proof that we, at least information theoretically, uh, can, can learn our true mean to error O of root log. Now, there are a few notes about this. Um, the firstly is that uh, we don't really need these things to be Gaussian. Um, if we know that the good samples are coming from some distribution where the tails are such that at most a one, alpha over 10 fraction uh, of the points are more than t away from the true mean in any direction, then we can return O of 1 and alpha many hypotheses with error guaranteed to be O of t. And so if you've got something other than a Gaussian with worse tail bounds, you can just use that. Secondly, there is a sort of effective version of this argument, which says that, well, maybe I can't generate this infinite set of hypotheses and deal with it, but if you gave me some set of hypotheses H, and guaranteed to me that at least one of these hypotheses was within R of the true mean. I can cut that set down to a set of only O of 1 and alpha many hypotheses with error O of R plus log 1 over alpha, and I can do that in polynomial time. And the basic idea is that in order for this argument to work, I only need this concentration to work in directions along differences between x and y, where x and y are in my set. And since there are only a reasonable number of those, I can just use linear programming to see which, for which of these you know, sets x, uh, for which of these hypotheses x, is there a set Sx that has the appropriate concentration in all of the relevant directions? This O hides the dimension? Um, this O part of the alpha. Uh, alpha is the rate of good samples. Right, but the dimension of the space. Uh, this is all dimension independent. The dimension of the space is n, which doesn't appear anywhere here. Um, so yeah, I, I can get these error bounds independent of the dimension that I'm working in. Of course, uh, I will need dimension dependent factors in the number of samples and the runtime of this algorithm. But if we're just caring about the error rates, then, then there's no dependence. So yeah, so what I can do is I can use a linear program to sort of find which guys have these sets Sx. And then once I have that by sort of the same lemma, I can cover the set of those hypotheses with a small number of balls. And I can do that perfectly reasonably. Okay, so in summary, what we have is that uh, Steinhardt, Char, Carr, and Valent gives an algorithm that attains O tilde of alpha to the minus a half error. But information theoretically, we know we can see, achieve square root log 1 over alpha error. So the natural question to ask is, what sort of error is achievable efficiently? Can we do better than this alpha to the minus a half? Can we even get down to square root log 1 over alpha? OK, so let's actually start talking about algorithms. And for this section, I'll start by talking about our basic techniques, which are filters and the generalization, which we call multi-filters. But these things run into an obstacle when we're trying to do error better than about alpha to the minus a half. And to get around this obstacle, there's an idea of looking at sort of higher degree moments. And I'll talk about that. And there's in particular a real problem with sort of controlling variances of things that requires a lot of technical detail that I'll touch on at least a little bit. Um, but we'll see, I guess. OK. So let's go back and sort of look at these problems from the beginning in sort of increasing order of complexity. So for the non-robust version of the algorithm, we just use the sample mean mu hat, and we're good. Now, for the moderately robust problem, we'd like to use the sample mean. But of course, there's a problem that a few bad samples, if they are very, very far from the true mean, they can actually seriously corrupt the sample mean. So we're going to need a way around that. And in particular, we're going to want to have a way to certify that the sample mean is actually close to the true mean. But it turns out that there's a good way to do this because 
If it were not the case that the sample mean and true mean were close, there'd have to be some direction in which they're far apart. Some unit vector v, such that v dot the difference is large. And in order for a small fraction of errors to change the mean in some direction by a lot, that actually requires that these small fraction of errors contribute a lot to the variance in that direction. So that's going to mean that the variance of v dot x is large. And we can detect this. We can compute the covariance matrix and see, are there any directions in which the variance is larger than it should be? Now, what do we do when we find these large directions of large variance? We know that they might be causing problems, but we need to, we need to actually do something about it if they are. But if v dot x is large, what that has to mean is because the Gaussian is so well concentrated that the only way you can add a small number of errors to increase the variance by a lot is by making them sort of pretty extreme outliers. So what you can do is you can project onto this v direction and it'll have to be the case that there are a bunch of sample points that are pretty far out from the mean. And just by sort of inspecting things, you should be able to find a threshold we're beyond which, well, maybe you can't say that everything beyond that threshold is, is a bad point because, of course, some of your good points will be very, very far from the true mean. But you can at least say that most of the points that you're throwing out are going to be bad samples. And so this gives us a pretty clean algorithm. What you do is you take a set S of samples. You compute the empirical covariance matrix. Now, if the largest eigenvalue of this matrix is small, that certifies that your sample mean is a good approximation to the true mean, so you just return that. Otherwise, what you do is you project onto this direction, you use that to create a filter, you apply this to your sample set, so you throw away everything beyond this threshold, this cleans up your set of samples, and then you just go back to step two and repeat this. And the analysis, at least at a high level, is pretty easy. Every iteration of this algorithm either makes your sample set sort of closer to the set of good samples, it either produces a cleaner sample, or it returns an answer that is certifiably accurate. And so it'll keep on cleaning up your sample set until it can't clean it up anymore, and then it will return an accurate answer, and then you're done. Okay, so that was the moderately robust case. What happens in the very robust case now, where only a small fraction of our samples are good? Well, most of these ideas still generalize in a natural way, but there's one major problem when we try and implement the filter. And that's the following. We found a large eigenvalue, we projected all of our samples onto that direction. We now need to sort these into good samples and bad samples. But unfortunately, we might end up with a distribution like this. And there are actually many places under this distribution that we can hide an alpha mass Gaussian. The problem is when alpha is more than a half, then like most of the samples are good, so like the median of your samples has to be close to the mean of your Gaussian. But when you only want a small number, there are a bunch of bumps, any of which could hide your Gaussian. And so we can't just say, well, here's a line, everything, you know, everything to the right of this line has to be bad, because, I mean, our, our, we don't know where the good samples are located. So to fix this, what we're going to do is instead of just splitting into good samples and bad samples, we're going to sort of bifurcate. We're going to split our samples into two sets of points, or, or maybe more. And we're going to want to have the guarantee that at least one of these sets of points contains a better fraction of good samples than our original set. And so maybe one of these sets of points threw out all of our good samples and then we're just getting garbage when we analyze it. But at least one of the sets, if we keep analyzing it, will continue to give us good results. And then for somewhat technical reasons, since we're sort of having an explosion in the number of sets that we're dealing with, uh, we want to make sure this doesn't get too bad. So we're going to guarantee, for example, that the sum of the squares of the sizes of these new sets of samples that we end up with is at most the squared size of the original set. Okay, and so how do we know that we can do this? Well, the analysis splits into two cases. 
In case one, almost all of the samples lie in the same small interval. And in case two, they don't. And in particular, what that means is there are two clusters of samples that are very far away from each other. So case one, if there is some interval i that contains, say, all but an alpha 3 over 3 fraction of our samples, then we can actually say that with high probability, the true mean is in this interval i. And in particular, that means that all but a tiny fraction of our good samples are within about square root log 1 over alpha of i after you've projected them onto this line. And in particular, that means that unless the variance in this direction is also similarly small, unless it's something like O of length of i squared plus log 1 over alpha, uh, then it's going to be the case that we can find a filter that will throw out a bunch of bad samples that, sort of, that are too far from the interval. And at most, an alpha fra squared fraction, say, of the removed samples will be good samples. And so in this case, it looks a lot like our old filter. We just throw out a bunch of samples, almost all of which are bad, and we've cleaned things up. The other case is a little bit more difficult. Suppose that there is no such interval i. Or in other words, sort of by adjusting it, we can find an interval i of about the same length where there's at least an alpha over 6 fraction of our samples on either side of it. So there are lots of samples out on the tails on either side. Maybe we can't just find a single interval where we can guarantee that the mean is in that interval. But we can do something else now. So for some value of x, we're going to pick two sets. S1 is going to be the set of samples that are less than or equal to, say, x plus 10 root log 1 over alpha. And S2 is going to be the set of samples that are bigger than or equal to x minus 10 root log 1 over alpha. And these, these have some overlap. And I claim the overlap is enough that, all but a, that, that if we at least pick the correct one of these S1 or S2, all but a tiny fraction of the removed samples are going to be bad. In particular, if the true mean is bigger than or equal to S, all but a tiny fraction of our samples are in S2. And if the true mean is less than or equal to x, all but a tiny fraction of our samples are in X1. And as long as x was picked to be somewhere in this interval, we've thrown out a fair number of bad samples on the, on the wrong side of it. And so in this case, you know, we're guaranteed that one of these sets had this property that sort of cleaned up our set. It threw out almost only bad samples. However, there was this extra technical condition that we needed to sort of guarantee that we don't just end up with an explosion of, of tons of sets that we're dealing with. We wanted the sum of the squares of the sizes of these sets to not be bigger than the squared size of the original. So how do we analyze that? Let's let f of x be the fraction of our samples that are less than or equal to x. So what we want is we want some x in our interval such that 1 minus f of x squared plus f of x plus 20 root log 1 over alpha squared is less than or equal to 1. This basically says that if we looked at the interval of everything bigger than or equal to x and everything less than or equal to x plus 20 root log, that, that those sets work. And, well, I mean, this doesn't necessarily happen. But if it fails, it's going to have to be the case that f of x plus 20 root log is much, much bigger than the square root of f of x. And this very quickly becomes a problem if our interval is long. Because it's going to be fine unless, well, I mean, f at the end of the interval was already alpha, or alpha over 6 or something. And so this would say that, well, we're going to be fine unless f of x plus 20 root log is at least root alpha. And then f of x plus 40 root log is at least alpha to the 1 quarter and f of x plus 60 root log is at least alpha to the 1 eighth, and so on and so forth. And after we've moved about log log 1 over alpha times square root log 1 over alpha away from the endpoint, suddenly we're demanding that almost all of the samples are on that side of the interval. And if our interval is too long, this, this can't possibly happen, essentially. And in particular, unless our interval 
is shorter than square root log one over alpha times log log one over alpha, we can always find an appropriate x such that these two sets exist. Okay, so what can we say? We can create a, either a filter or a multi-filter that will allow us to make progress as long as one of the following two holds. Either there is no interval of length i of, of you know, root, square root log 1 over alpha, log log 1 over alpha, that contains all but an alpha over 3 fraction of samples. Or there is an interval of i of that length that contains all but an alpha over 3 fraction of samples, and the variance is something like omega of i squared. <coughs> and in particular, that means that as long as the variance in some direction is more than a sufficient multiple of, of, with a little bit of improvement to this argument, you can actually get down to log 1 over alpha. If there's a direction with that variance, then we can actually find these sets. We can find at most two sets SI, such that for at least one of these sets, we've at most an alpha squared fraction of the points that we threw out were good. And furthermore, the sum of the squares of the sizes of these sets is at most the squared size of the original. And finally, this allows us to build our multi-filter. So what we're going to do is we're going to, instead of maintaining one set of samples, we're going to maintain several of them. For each i, we're going to compute an empirical covariance matrix. Now, if some empirical covariance matrix has a large eigenvalue, we're going to project, we're going to create a multi-filter, we're going to apply it, perhaps breaking that set into two new sets, and then we're going to go back to step two. And we're just going to repeat this until everything has small eigenvalues. And then when we're done, we're going to just return the list of all of the sample means of all of these sets. Yeah? What if the outlier, the, the error distribution has Gaussians but with much smaller widths? Then you just retain all of them. Um, what happens if our error distribution has Gaussians of smaller width and we retain all of them? Well, the point is that if we retain all of them, that means that our covariance matrix is going to have to be small. Um, and what we'll see in a bit is that if your covariance matrix is small and you contain almost all of the good samples, then that's going to imply that the sample mean has to be at least reasonably close to the true mean. And so, sort of, you can add errors that this thing doesn't detect, but the only way you can do that is by adding errors that don't really mess up the sample mean by too much. Okay, but let's look at the analysis. So the point is that at every step of this, at least one of these sets that we're working with will have at least an alpha fraction of good samples. In fact, it'll be a, a lot better in terms of good samples than we started with. And secondly, it'll always be the case that the sum of the squares of the sizes of these sets is at most the squared size of the original set. And this is mostly useful to say that we'll never have more than a polynomial number of these sets, so we'll never return more than a polynomial number of hypotheses, and it will not, won't take more than polynomial time. Fine. Okay, but when we return an answer, what happens? Well, if we have some SI that has an alpha fraction of good samples, and its covariance matrix has no large eigenvalues, what does that mean? Well, for any unit vector, log 1 over alpha is much bigger than the variance of the set in that direction. And that's going to be at least alpha times v dot the difference between the means in that square. And in particular, that says in every direction the difference between the means is O of something like alpha to the minus a half times square root log 1 over alpha. And in particular, that gives us a bound on the error between the means. And so, well, we've managed to reconstruct this O tilde of alpha to the minus a half from uh, Steinhardt, Charakar, and Valiant, but uh, we'll hopefully be able to take these techniques and push them a little bit further. Unfortunately, there's actually a major obstacle for these techniques at about alpha to the minus a half. Because you can actually have error as much as alpha to the minus a half and still have well-controlled variance. Because maybe what we have is we've got you know, some big cluster of points near some mean. And then our good points are this tiny alpha fraction of points somewhat displaced from that mean. Our good points, though, can be displaced by as much as alpha to the minus a half 
before they contribute more than one to the variance in that direction. And so if we're willing to live with variances as large as one or even log one over alpha, then we certainly, we, we can't detect the fact that our good samples are off by alpha to the minus a half. Okay, so how do we deal with this? Basically, the problem that we're running into is that these bounds that we saw on second moments are not enough to ensure the kind of concentration that we want. We want to make sure that all of our points, and thus our good points, are sort of close to the sample mean. But our bounds, are, our concentration bounds, aren't good enough because we're only using second moments. Well, there's an obvious fix for that. Let's use higher moments. And when you start looking at this, this looks nice. It says, well, so if it were the case that for all unit vectors v, the, say, 2D central moment in the v direction was O of 1, well, that would tell us that this 1 was much bigger than alpha times the 2D moment of the error between the true mean and sample mean in that direction. And that would say the error between the true mean and sample mean is O of alpha to the minus 1 in 2D, which is great. This, I mean, instead of alpha to the minus 1 and 2, we can get alpha to the minus 1 and 4, 6, 8, whatever, we can get something pretty good. Unfortunately, get, sort of arranging for this to be the case is actually hard. It's computationally intractable to determine whether or not there is a unit vector v such that the 2d central moment in the v direction is large whenever d is bigger than 1. And since we can't solve this problem, we can't know whether or not our d central moments or our 2 d central moments are bounded or not. And that's going to be an issue. Now, the basic idea for how to fix this is to look at a relaxation of this problem that we actually can solve. And there are a bunch of sort of contemporaneous works that do the relaxation by sort of, instead of, you know, actually just can you find a v for this, Instead, they say, is there a sum of squares proof that our, higher, that our central moments are bounded? And, well, if you can find a sum of squares proof, you're good. And if you can't find a sum of squares proof, well, hopefully you can use that to show something else. Now, in this talk, we went to, on a slightly different idea. The idea is to relax in a different way. What we're going to do is see, is there any degree D polynomial where the expectation of p squared is much larger than it should be. Okay. Um, and in particular, if we take p to be v dot x raised to the d, we'll be, we'll be good. So what's the basic idea? Um, we're going to determine whether or not there is a degree d polynomial p where the expectation of p of s squared is substantially larger than the expectation of p of a Gaussian at our sample mean squared. And this looks really great. It's an eigenvalue computation, so we can do it. If it's not true, then we get our bounds. The error between mu and the sample mean is O tilde of alpha to the minus 1 in 2d. And if there is such a p, we can hope to create some kind of a multi-filter. And, well, what you'd like to be able to say is, well, the variance of p of x is larger than it should be. So we're just going to look at the values of p, and we're going to find the outliers, and we're going to throw them away. Or maybe we're going to take two overlapping sets and do the same sort of thing. And this sounds like it should work, but there's a really annoying uh, technical difficulty, which is that the variance of p of g might actually be large. And one thing that we used in the degree one case is that if you have a linear function, the variance of that linear function of your Gaussian doesn't depend on the mean of the Gaussian. However, with even degree two polynomials, that's no longer the case. And since we don't know the mean of G, we don't know the mean of the variance. And dealing with that proves to be uh, pretty difficult. Now, I'm told that I'm short on time, so I'm going to probably skip a lot of this. Um, but what is the very basic idea? Uh, if we find, we, we'd like to be able to verify, basically, that the expectation of the square of our polynomial isn't too big. And the expectation of p squared of our Gaussian is some polynomial q of mu, where q is some polynomial in the, in the true mean mu. 
And the thing that allows us to get this to work is that this in turn equals the expectation of R of G1 through G2D, where R is a multilinear polynomial, and these GIs are independent copies of G. And what makes this work more or less is that if this is large, that's a thing we can actually detect. Because that should say that, that if we take a bunch of independent samples from X and evaluate R at those, we should get values of that that are too big. And so that's the thing at least that we can see. And well, basically because R is multilinear, we can treat it as sort of a linear polynomial in each coordinate. And if this is returning values that are bigger than they should be, we can then use that to find a linear function that's returning values that are bigger than they should be. And that was sort of exactly the thing that allows us to produce a filter. Um, so again, I'm going to skip a lot of this because it's technical and I don't have time. Um, but in the end, basically, um, we, we need a number of samples that's something like poly n to the d over alpha. And the runtime is a little bit more than that because we need to check for some of these events that happen with probability alpha to the 2d. And so our runtime is polynomial in the number of samples and alpha to the minus d. But the theorem is we have an algorithm runs in this sort of reasonable amount of time and samples. And with high probability, it returns a list of O of 1 and alpha many hypotheses. Um, so that with high probability, at least one of them is within O sub D of alpha to the minus 1 and 2D of the true mean. Now, you can actually do this for D being super constant. We showed that in quasi-polynomial time and samples, you can actually get this down to polylog error. And we don't have this quite worked out in the paper, but we think with a slightly sharper analysis, you can actually get the error down to the information theoretically optimal O of square root log. OK, um, so um, in fact, if you're looking at the sort of list decoding result, it's quantitatively tight, at least for statistical query algorithms. And Ilias should talk a lot more about these a little later in the day. But the theorem is that if you have any statistical query list decoding algorithm that with at least two thirds probability returns a list of hypotheses, at least one of which is closer than, than alpha to the minus one and D of the mean, it must do one of the following. It must either return exponentially many hypotheses, perform exponentially many queries, which is basically the analog for spending exponential runtime, or return queries with or with accuracy n to the minus omega of d, which is morally a stand-in for take more than n to the d samples. And so, I mean, this is a restricted computational model, but at least morally speaking, we expect that these bounds that we have are tight. If you want to do get better error, you either need to take as many samples as we do, return exponentially many hypotheses, or spend exponential runtime. Um, and well, I'm, I'm pretty much out of time. I, I will say that there's a very nice application of this to learning mixtures of spherical Gaussians. So here there are no errors, but you, you have a mixture of Gaussians. And this is very nice because, well, if you just run our list decoding algorithm on a mixture of Gaussians, you can simultaneously think of this distribution as a noisy version of each component Gaussian. And so you're guaranteed that you have, for each Gaussian, at least one hypothesis is close to the mean of that component. <laughs> and if furthermore you assume that the pairwise means are reasonably well separated from each other, separated by about more than the error in our list decoding algorithm, then having these hypotheses actually allows you to do clustering in a very natural way. You just sort of round sample to the nearest hypothesis and cluster them together naturally. And this actually allows you to recover the original components. And so the result is that if the means of your components have separation, something like k to the 1 and 2d, um, then this algorithm takes something like polynomial and n and dk to the d samples, runs in polynomial time, and returns accurate approximations to the means of the components. And I will say a few things. One, sort of before this and the bunch of contemporaneous works came out, the best that was known is that you could do this
with k to the one quarter separation. Um, and so we can get it, you know, k to the delta separation for any arbitrarily small delta. And in fact, once again, if you're willing to spend poly um, uh, sorry, quasi polynomial time in samples, you can get this down to polylogarithmic or maybe even square root log k separation. Beyond square root log k separation, there are information theoretic reasons why you can't approximate the means anymore. Um, and, um, well, okay. In conclusion, so what we have here is we've got a robust list decoding algorithm with substantially better error than had been known before. It has this nice application to learning mixtures of spherical Gaussians with k to the delta separation. And a few open questions to look at. Um, one is how much can the Gaussian assumption be relaxed in this work? Um, at very least, our techniques um, are sort of very heavily dependent on facts about higher degree polynomials of Gaussians. Um, the sum of squares techniques can relax this somewhat. It'd be interesting to see if you can do better than that. Um, also, can you do better for trying to learn uh, mixtures of Gaussians than you can for list decoding? So we know that if you can do list decoding, you can use that to learn mixtures, but we don't have any reason, we don't know that, that sort of these are equivalent problems. Maybe learning mixtures is easier, maybe you can do it in polynomial time, even with only square root log uh, separation. That'd be interesting. Also, if you don't care about actually learning the individual means, um, maybe you can try to find better algorithms for density estimations. Uh, here, these sort of information theoretic lower bounds don't even apply, um, and you could hope that you could do density estimation for this mixture of Gaussians with, without any separation assumptions. Um, but again, nobody knows how to do that. Okay, that's all I had to say. Are there any questions? So we have time for one question while the next speaker uh, comes up. Yeah. When you say that we don't know how to uh, do density estimation for mixture of Gaussians, you mean efficiently, that's uh, Yeah, efficiently. Um, yeah, if you want to do it inefficiently, that's not hard. Um, I'm just using my mouse. Okay. okay. So let's take the speaker again. Five minutes.